Oh, snap. You put the hottest hot end on the coolest tool head on your 3D printer, but nobody's made part cooling ducts that fit. You ask on Discord, but nobody wants to make them either. Make your own, they say. It's easy, they say. What now? You could demand other people's time and effort for free. Great choice. For failures! You could protest that you don't know CAD. Okay, fine, but you still need those ducts. Hey, good job. You learned CAD. Now for some expert duct advice. Wait, what? They said it was easy, but they don't know how to do it either? All right, all right, all right, all right. I'm here now. Let's talk ducks. I'm about to share all my secrets, and I'll show you how I designed this duck along the way. Ducks get air from point A to point B. Easy? Sure. Until you also need to get from shape C to shape D around obstacles E, F, and G, then it can be downright diabolical. Duct design has a reputation for being black magic. That's not totally wrong, but I'd say it's only about 5% magic, and the rest is just knowing how to approach it, and lots of practice. My goal is to take some mystery out of the process. If you've never designed ducts, I hope this will give you confidence to jump in, and if you have, you might learn a few things here to help improve your next design. Please note this is how to design ducts, not how to model them in your particular CAD. I believe that for 90% of use cases, the best CAD is the one you're comfortable in. I'm sure I don't have to tell you to argue about the best CAD in the comments. It's definitely not SketchUp 2016. But if I can do this in SketchUp, you can definitely do it in something better. For that reason, I'm focusing on the approach rather than the tools, so you can apply these tips no matter what you use. What about CFD? CFD is Computational Fluid Dynamics. It's where the computer tells you if your duct is good. It's also tricky to use and usually expensive. Long story short, these tips should help you get that 95% good duct performance without CFD. If you have access and skills to use it, that's where you can start in on that black magic 5%. If you don't, don't sweat it. Testing trumps simulations anyway. On the other hand, if you're already doing CFD and struggling to get good simulation results, these tips might help you troubleshoot what's wrong. I'm nice, so I'll share my best tip first. If you get nothing else out of this video, get this. The golden rule of duct design is to narrow your ducts gradually. This is actually an HVAC rule of thumb, but it seems to work even at small scales. Don't narrow a duct by more than 11 degrees measured wall versus opposite wall. Any sharper than that, and it starts to throttle airflow. Sometimes you have to anyway, but the closer you can stick, the better. This is why people stick 45 degree cone reductions on fans to adapt them for CPAP hose, and then complain it doesn't work. First steps. How do you start? You don't start in CAD, you start by testing your fan. Especially if you're going for cooling, as I am with this design, your goal is to get fast airflow out the end. You can get faster airflow by narrowing the duct, but only to a point. <laughs> Every fan has a tipping point where, as you narrow down the outlet, the air feed will go from increasing to decreasing again because you start choking the fan. So this is something you really have to figure out empirically. You can do it with cardboard, you can do it with test prints, but you need to figure out how much can you narrow down the outlet before your fan can't handle it. If you skip this step, you're wasting your time with everything else. With that out of the way, let's jump into CAD. Once you know what your fans can handle, the other step before starting your actual duct is to model your constraints. This means modeling what your duct has to work around, including the structure of your printer and tool head, your build volume, and probably the hot parts of your hot end so that your duct doesn't melt. You can see I've already done that here. So a quick note on what I'm designing here. This is a split part cooling duct for a new hot end. I'm reusing the top and bottom segments, but I designed them the same way that I'll be showing in this video. I have fairly complex constraints to work around. I need to take this from a large half circle at the top to a rectangle nozzle at the bottom. I need to twist it and make a direction change. My basic workflow is going to be setting out my constraints, figuring out a smooth spline to join top to bottom, run a starting duct along there, twist it, widen and tallify it, narrow one side to match the upper shape, and you'll also see me rebuilding my mesh to make sure that I have a consistent wall thickness throughout. This took about two and a half real-time hours.
Now the easiest way I know to get started with a duct is to place your start and finish and then work to join them together. This is a lot easier than trying to work from the start to the end. If you've got complex constraints to work around, you may need some intermediate shapes along the way. Think about making your ducts smooth. You need a smooth overall run with big curves. One tool you'll hear a lot about in the course of working on ducts is lofting. Lofting comes from boat building, and studying boat building is actually how I first learned these skills. The idea is that you set stations with a known cross-section, and then you connect them by smooth curves. You might notice that I'm really taking my time at this stage, testing different paths between the inlet and the outlet trying to figure out what is going to be the smoothest and fit nicely between my constraints. This is one of the most important parts of the process, just blocking out the run of the duct, especially when you've got a duct that's fairly wide, as this one ends up being. It's easy to end up with a duct that has really sharp corners, and if you can avoid those, it's going to make your life a lot easier down the line as you start smoothing things out. The ideal duct cross-section shape is a circle. The more perimeter you have for your cross-sectional area, the less efficient your duct will be, because you'll have more friction. I work in rectangles because it reduces poly count and makes my life easier, not because it's ideal. Most tools will let you work with rounded shapes, and where you can, you should. You can't always get away with a nice circle because of your constraints, but do your best. For the best looking ducts, I prefer to apply transitions as S's rather than Z's. This means easing in and out of changes to the duct shape and size, instead of applying a constant rate of change through a full transition. You can fake this by easing into a linear change and then easing back out, but I get the best results by using a spreadsheet that takes a requested width or height or twist delta and splits it up according to a sine wave distribution that's never actually linear at any point along the change. That's where I'm getting the move and twist numbers that I'm applying to the transitions you see me modeling here. You can change different aspects of the duct along different segments of the duct. For example, you could narrow it in one part and twist it in another. This can help keep things smooth. The shortest possible duct with hard bends is likely to underperform versus one that's a little longer but follows a smoother path with larger radius bends. I suspect worrying too much about duct length is a big reason otherwise skilled designers end up with bad ducts. Don't be afraid to take a less direct path, even through a different plane, to get a smoothly curved duct. If you need a sharp bend, try to make it around the narrow axis, not a sweep along the wide axis. Watch out for pinches when you have really wide ducts. If you're using a CAD program that has lofting available, Lofting can cause problems if you try to change too much through the wrong parts of your duct. Try having more stations and spreading them out so that you're not overlapping too many changes to the size, shape, and direction of your duct. So here's an example of how changing a particular dimension of a duct through the wrong segment of your duct can cause problems. I was changing the width of the duct over a long run, but the end of that run ran around this corner that was already fairly sharp and really messed it up. I didn't like how this looked, so I backed it out, and I made my width change just a little bit faster to finish above that sharp corner, and that avoided the problem. Much smoother. Now thinking back to that golden rule of narrowing your ducts gradually, in the real world you apply that by managing the cross section of your duct all the way along the run very carefully. You don't want to change the cross sectional area too fast or you're going to be throttling your airflow. 
It's actually better to change shape quickly than to change cross-sectional area quickly. Sometimes you can get away with a faster shape change as long as the cross-section through there stays about the same. To keep your duct as efficient as possible, I suggest you don't cut down to the final outlet cross-section too soon. Large ducts are more efficient than small ones, so you may as well keep it as large as possible, as long as possible. Thinking about the nozzles, I aim my nozzles to just clip the nozzle tip and to get under any intruding parts of the hot end. Okay, one last tip before I close this out. Small changes in outlet nozzle size and geometry can have a big impact on cooling performance. For this reason, I like to keep the nozzle separate in CAD for easy iteration. You might be changing it a lot. Okay, so at this point, the duct I'm designing is about 95% done. I'm pretty happy with it. It's not done yet, but the rest of the work is just tweaking and fairing and boring manual mesh subdivision to fix all the nasty triangle folding and other stuff that doesn't really belong in this video, as well as final adjustments to either the duct or the tool head or both to make sure they respect each other's space a little better. Thanks for following along. I hope this helps. If you think I missed something, or if you've got good tips for duct modeling in specific CAD programs, please share them in the comments. And, of course, if you've got questions about anything I shared here, put those below too, and I'll do my best to get back to you. Just don't ask me to make ducts for you. <laughs>